So, um, de-extinction, reanimation, resurrection, they all are after the fact. They're about dealing with the fact of death. And the question arises, wouldn't it be simpler to just keep things alive, just to keep us alive? And to that end, I've invited Michael Fossil to come and speak to you. Um, he's an expert in the science of cell aging. So he'll explain to you what happens when those telomeres shorten. The objective of his therapy is to keep them from shortening. And in fact, the question is, can he make them get longer again? Michael? Thank you. I, I got to tell you, there's, it's not double helix anymore, but yeah. No. Thank you, right? It's a great name. Though. I was going to have to come out and say good morning, but I almost came to say good afternoon. Welcome to, uh, to Idea City. Um, some 70,000 years ago, the first human beings on this planet had competition, and that was Neanderthals and Homo erectus. We, uh, our ancestors, had one enormous advantage, which was the ability to think about and talk about things that don't exist. Things like Wednesday, like being on time, um, like tomorrow, like God, art, science, compassion, and dreams. Um, these are things that you can't throw a spear at, you can't eat them, you can't steal them, you can't touch them, and yet these are things that touch each and every one of us. And they also touch directly on the core of what it means for us to be human. Now, I've had a dream for 30 years, and my dream has been to reverse human aging. And I don't mean slow it down, I don't mean stop it, I mean literally reverse it. Because what I would like to do is be able to cure and prevent age-related diseases. Things like strokes, heart attacks, and Alzheimer's dementia. These are the things that rob us of our humanity. Well, for the last 4,700 years, the whole idea of reversing human aging um, has been only fiction. Uh, we've always thought about reversing human aging, but we've never gotten there. The earliest known piece of human literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It was found in Nineveh in a library a couple of decades ago. And in the very last chapter of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh has lost his best friend Enkidu. And he'd like to bring him back, resurrect him. Isn't going to happen. But he's told that there is a plant that grows underwater that restores lost youth. Well, he gets it, but it gets stolen by a snake, which is entirely appropriate because for the last 5,000 years, the idea of reversing human aging has been snake oil, pure and simple. At best, it's been fiction. Stories like the epic, books, movies, all full of these things, but they have been no more than fiction. How do you go from fiction to reality? How do you go from dreams to realizing a dream? I think you need two things. You need tools, and you need the ability to use the tools. I sometimes say you need a ship and a map. Pretty simple. The ship takes you there, but the map tells you where you're going to go so you don't get lost. You don't get lost in some big storm. Well. If what you want to do is go to the moon, the map is simple. Nobody has any question about where it is. It's there. But getting to it takes a lot of very special tools, quite literally a ship, and we only managed it a little less than 50 years ago. Sometimes the opposite is the case. The, the map is very confusing. The tools are simple, but the map is not so simple. If what I want to do is prevent smallpox, you can do that with a needle. I could do it 70,000 years ago with a bone shard. I can do it right now with my fingernail. But what I need is some understanding of cowpox, smallpox, microbes, disease, immunization, something that tells me how to use that finger. So literally, I could do it. Most things in life need two things. They need both the chip and the map, both the tools and the understanding. And the classic example is aging. It's only been in the last few years we've had the tools we need, and frankly, we've had a misunderstanding about the map. For example, if I go back 60 years ago, these are, oh, it is backwards for me but you've got young human cells and old human cells. But we used to, 60 years ago, all biologists mostly agreed that cells never aged. You age, I age, something between our cells age, but cells never age. Well, they do. They are young cells and old cells. They clearly age. But it took somebody with common sense to find that. This is a friend of mine. This is Len Hayflick. This is when he and I were having dinner together in Sydney, Australia. We were giving a talk years ago. Every, and that's, there's Len. But every Christmas, I get a card from he and Ruth, and every Christmas, I worry that aging is going to catch up with Len, or Ruth, or me. And it hasn't so far. Um, Len is a friend, and he's also a curmudgeon. But he's also one of the bravest people I know. Len is the sort of guy that if right now there was a huge um, parade came sailing through here, and there's the emperor, 
Len would be standing here saying, the emperor has no clothes. And he's got a really interesting birthmark in his right buttock. He is observant, he's careful, and he's fearless. And he needed to be. Because for years, people kept saying, you're wrong. Well, he wasn't wrong. He was absolutely right. Cells do age. But they don't age the way you might think. It's not a matter of hours, days, weeks, months, years. They age when they divide. Every time a cell divides, it ages. I have to tell you a secret. I've never understood this. Biology is the weirdest science. It's the only thing you know about where multiply and divide mean the exact same thing. <laughs> so <laughs> cells divide, and they get older. But the question is, how do I know as a cell that I'm old or young? How do I know that? And no one knew until another friend of mine came along. This is Alexei Lavnikov. He is a character. Alexei had never been outside the Soviet Union until a few years ago when I invited him to my home. Come see me. And I feel badly because you saw part of my garden. Come see me sometime. He has a little flat in the middle of Moscow, and I have enormous respect for Alexei. But right in the middle of making dinner for Alexei, a big thunderstorm blew off the lake and hit our house. And I heard no heat, power, lights, water, nothing. Alexei goes right to basics, and he looks at me and says, you know, Michael, this is not so different from Moscow. <laughs> He's right. I mean, when you get down to basics, it's pretty much the same. Well, he got down to basics also when it came to biology, and he got it right. He said, listen, if I'm a cell and I'm going to divide or multiply, I have to duplicate everything, including this big, long chromosome I've got here. So if I'm standing at the end of the chromosome, that's the telomere, I can duplicate everything except the part I'm standing on. Hmm. It's sort of like painting the kitchen floor. I can paint all the way around it, but sooner or later, the only way to paint the part I'm standing on is to come back when the paint dries and get the missing piece. So Alexei said two things. He said, one, something has to come back and paint the missing piece. Something has to give me the end of the telomere that got missing. And it is. It's called telomerase. The other thing he said was, listen, this shortening of the telomeres, I bet that explains cell aging. That times it. Well, he was right. But, as many of you know, this being Toronto, sometimes it takes a Canadian. <laughs> this is another friend. This is Cal Harley. He used to teach just down the lake here, down at Hamilton at McMaster's. Until about 1990, when he did what we all tend to do sooner or later, he went to California. <laughs> so I'd been out there about a decade before teaching at Stanford. He came out to join a biotech firm called Gerum. We'll come back to Gerum. But Cal is the guy who said, you know, if you look at telomere shortening and you look at cell aging, they exactly correspond. And later on, he came back and said, he proved that, in fact, telomere shortening causes cell aging, or at least times it. Well, that's where we were in the mid-1990s. And that's when I put out the first two papers ever in the Journal of American Medical Association about cell aging and telomere aging and the implications for human disease. Part of what I said is, we have the map wrong. Here's what most of us think. I'm getting old, things have fallen apart, I'm starting to rust. What do you expect? I got damage, I age. That's not at all. It's backwards. What's actually going on is my telomeres shorten, my genes no longer have me repair and recycle my cell as well, so I begin to accumulate damage. So it's not true that you get, dam I mean, you get damage and therefore you age. It's that you age and therefore that permits you to accumulate damage. The map is a little backwards. So it goes something like this again. Cells divide or multiply. Telomeres shorten. Gene expression changes, turns down the ability to maintain the cell, like this. I've got a house, and every morning, the telomere sends me a message. And when I'm young, it says, get up, check the plumbing, check the electricity, repair the tiles in the roof, repaint the living room, and fix the carpet. But that's not what it says when I'm old. When I'm old, it says, don't bother getting out of bed. If you do, sit on the couch, watch daytime cereals, and eat bonbons. The house goes to hell. But that's what happens to my cells, too. You know, as I get older, things don't work as well. Not only me, but the neighborhood. So if I've got cells around me, even if they don't divide, they begin to show problems. The tissues fail, the cells, the organs fail, I fail, I've got disease, I'm old. Well, the key still is that pattern of gene expression, because it means everything. A hundred years ago, what we used to think was that the difference between my toes and my nose was they had different genes. Not at all. Same genes, different gene expression, different tune. It's like if I have a huge symphony orchestra up here, and with the same set of instruments, I can play Mozart, I can play the blues, I can play Grateful Dead. It just takes a different score, different tune, different conductor. Okay? But they're the same instruments, more or less. I don't have to have different genes. Same thing as the difference between my toes and my nose. It's just a different tune. In fact, that's what's going on in aging. The difference between me at age three and me now at age 63, you didn't think that, but damn, uh, is my, it's not my genes and it's not gene damage. It's the pattern of gene expression. 
and that says it along. So the question I have to ask myself is, can we do anything about it? Well, back about 20 years ago, I put out the first book on this, and I said, maybe we can do something about it. I was correct in titling Reversing Human Aging, but it was very unwise of me, because I have to go around the world to different institutions and, and universities, and for example, outside of Washington, Bethesda, Maryland, I'm talking at the National Institutes of Health, and I've got an auditorium just like this one, very s steeply raked, and there are literally hundreds of physicians and researchers from around the world looking down on me, literally and figuratively. Figuratively, why? Because I'm talking about the impossible, reversing human aging. Plainly, this is nonsense. It's snake oil. How do you deal with that? I only know one way, and so I did. I tried absolute honesty, and I said, listen, before I even start, let me say this to all of you. Anyone who leaves this room in an hour and thinks you can reverse human aging is naive. But anyone who leaves this room in an hour and thinks you cannot reverse aging is equally naive. If you are sensible, if you're logical, you'll leave here at the end of the hour, and you'll say, I don't know whether you can reverse aging or not. Show me the data. So let me show you the data. So I did. There wasn't all that much data 20 years ago, but there was some. However, since that time, because of people like Cal Harley, Canadian, and other colleagues of his at Geron, we have a fair amount of data. For example, if what I have here is a young cell, it looks young, it acts young, it's got a young pattern of gene expression. And I have an old cell over here, it looks old, it acts old, it's got an old pattern of gene expression. If I reset the telomere lengths and gene expression, I end up with a young cell. I just reversed aging in human cells 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Now, none of you are just cells. You are tissues, organs, organisms sitting out here. So can we do a little better? Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so let's try this. We'll take a set of young human skin cells. We're going to grow them in a mouse. It, it can work. I get a young piece of human skin, and it's nice stuff. It's thick, it's tough, it holds together very well. Now I take cells from an old donor, old human skin cells, and I grow them in a mouse. And it's thin, it's like tissue paper. It sloughs easily, it doesn't hold together well. Now I take the same cells, I reset the pattern of gene expression using telomere length, and I grow them in the mouse again, and guess what you get? You get young human skin. I just reversed aging 14 years ago in human tissues. You do the same thing for bone tissue. You do the same, same thing for a lot of tissues. For example, most of us in this room, I hate to tell you this, but it's true, most of us in this room, the majority, will end up dying of arterial disease. Strokes, heart attacks, and other things. Now, if you have a stroke, it is not the fault of your brain cells. If you have a heart attack, it is not the fault of your heart muscle cells. It's the fault of the arteries. And if I look at a diseased artery and ask myself where the problem begins, it's the cells that line the inner side of that. They're called endothelial cells. So what if I take old endothelial cells with atherosclerotic disease and I reset telomere links? I get young arterial tissue. As a physician, as a professor in medicine, that means something interesting to me. It means maybe we can do something about diseases that we haven't been able to do before. So back 10 years ago, I put out what is the first and still the only medical textbook on this with Oxford University Press. And what I said was this. From what I know about diseases related to aging and the pathology involved, all of it can be traced back to aging cells. Furthermore, probably the single most effective point of intervention clinically, the easy, efficient way to do things, is not heart transplants, coronary artery bypass grafts, statins, or knee replacements. What happens if I reset telomere lengths? Because my guess is we can do an effective job of curing and preventing age-related diseases. Where's the data? Well, in the last 10 years, there's been a fair amount of data from around the world. These are, oh, these are two key players. This up here is Maria Blasco, down in Madrid, and she's done a lot of things. But one of the things she did was shows that if you can maintain telomere length in, in rats, she can delay aging in all the organs she looks at. This over here is Ron DePino. Ron was at Harvard, now he's out at Dallas. I don't know why he left, better weather probably. But what he found was even more interesting. He'll take an old mouse. Now this old mouse has a brain that's about three quarters the volume of a young mouse. Now in that living mouse, he resets telomere length. And what happens? The brain grows back to normal volume and the mouse begins to act like a normal mouse. I'm a pessimist, I would have bet against this actually. But that's what happened. Now, Probably few of you out here are rats or mice, and most of us really don't give a rip how long our rats and mice live. We care about human beings. So can we do this with humans? Fine, you should ask that question. This is Noel Patton. Noel Patton is a businessman, but with a passion. 
Noel, a couple of years ago, went to Jaron. Remember Jaron? And he said, I noticed you've patented recently these four compounds. These are astragalocyte compounds. And I noticed that these are telomerase activators. They reset telomere links somehow in humans. And I noticed that they derive from a root that's been as, used as an herbal preparation in some Asian populations for a few thousand years. I would like to buy the nutraceutical rights. Now, nutraceuticals have two characteristics, requirements, really. One is they have to have been in human use, so they're presumed safe. They are. Two is you may not make disease claims. So he can't say, Noel and his company cannot say, it prevents Alzheimer's, it cures arterial disease. What he can say is it makes you young. And if he'd done that, he'd be just another businessman. But that's not what he did. What Noel did was he said to you, I will sell you these compounds, but with two conditions. You have to be willing to undergo laboratory and clinical studies before you start and after, so I can see if it makes a difference, or is it snake oil? That made a big difference to me, because the first study came out in a medical journal I used to edit three years ago. And what they found was that if you look at people who've taken these compounds for six to 12 months, the immune system acts like it's about 10 years younger. Hmm. Second study came out last year, and what it found is if you look at things like glucose, insulin, cholesterol, blood pressure, bone mineral density, and a number of other biomarkers, markers of health, they all show improvements in people who have taken these medications, these drugs. Huh. Well, notice what did not happen. Nobody went from age 70 to age 40. It didn't happen. Okay? Something happened, though. There's no question something's going on. My best estimate is that these compounds are about 5% as effective as I need them to be if I want to be able to do things like cure Alzheimer's. Almost everybody in this room, I'll bet, has some experience with dementia. I do. Probably you do. Anybody here have a friend, relative, anybody who's had or has dementia? Colleague, worker, you see what I mean? You people have some idea why this matters. It does to me. It does to you. So can we do anything about it? Well, you remember I said that we needed the tools and we needed to know how to use the tools. Well, in the last two years, I mean, for 20 years, I've been talking about the map. But the ship, the last two years, we begin to have what I need, which is the ability to take the two human genes that create telomerase, package them in a special way, deliver them to human cells, have them reset telomere length, and dissolve, because I don't want them around after that. You remember at the beginning of this talk, I said, well, here, we, I mean, one of the things is this is the first time in history we've been able to try this. But one of the things I said in the beginning of this talk was that the key part of being human is the ability to think about things and talk about things that don't exist. That is only half of it. The key part is to be able to take things that don't exist and make them exist. To take dreams and make them to reality. To take compassion and use it to create cures. We've cured smallpox. Um, at this point in history, we're at the point where, in the near future, I think we can take things like Alzheimer's disease and make it something that's no longer part of our future, but part of our past. Thanks. So, Michael, when all of this comes to fruition. Telomerase, is it a liquid? Is it a solid? Do I consume it? Is it injected? How much are you going to pay? No. <laughs> um, I mean, what we're talking about is an injectable. Um, certainly, what we're talking about is starting it with human cells, moving to small animals, large animals, and starting the first human trials. We could start human trials within a year or so, as we can get to the, you know, through the initial trials. But it would be injectable at first. It'd probably be needed every 10 years. So, One yeah. shot every 10 years? Well, it takes you a while to unage. It takes you a while to age again. So, and by the way, you're never going to live forever. Wow. Isn't going to happen. So. Um, and and w why are you always speaking about it in the future? Because you've been on this thought for some time, right? Well, and you said human trials will begin. 20 years ago, I predicted that the first actual use of a compound would occur within 10 to 20 years. It was actually 11 years that we first had the first beginning informal trial of astralogocytes. Um, now what I'm trying to do is figure out how we can get the technology to begin doing this really. As I say, we need something more effective than astralogocytes. That's not going to stop Alzheimer's. And is this theoretically something that can be patented by a single individual, a single not easily, company? Not easily. Uh, there are parts of it we put a patent on, but um, we'll see. Uh, you know, my goal, though, it, it reminds me of Mother Teresa. You know, Mother Teresa had a goal in life, and on the other hand, that woman now had to stay in the black. 
You know, she never went in the red. But that was not the reason she did it. Um, I don't mind making a lot of money on a patent, but that's not why you do it. There are bigger things in life. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. Picture. Gene. Yeah.